Hello and welcome to our week two recording. Uh, we'll take a look at bones and skeletal tissues in today's discussion. And so uh, the corresponding slides for this are on our site in the lecture one portion of the, the discussion. So we take off here having already laid our foundation for anatomy and physiology. And now we dive a little bit deeper into the discussion. And in order to start the discussion of the skeletal system, we need to start with cartilage. So as you remember, when we discussed within the anatomy and physiology portion of the discussion, part of understanding anatomy is in the developmental portion of anatomy. So developmentally, bone within, you know, that we're born with, uh, bone is derived from cartilage. So in order to make it through the birth canal, we were all mostly cartilage when we were born. And so it makes sense that that cartilage over time would ossify or turn into bone. So two key roots that we're gonna see in this discussion are chondro, C-H-O-N-D-R-O, that you'll need to equate with cartilage. And then we'll also see osteo or ossify. That root is gonna be related to bone. And one of the interesting things with cartilage is that it doesn't have its own blood vessels or nerve feed. So it exists within a connective tissue surrounding that's called perichondrium. So peri means around, and we see that root of chondro. So this is a, a covering around the cartilage that contains all the blood vessels for nutrient delivery to the cartilage. So cartilage is actually getting everything that it needs from a nutrient perspective from the perichondrium that's surrounding it. There are three types of cartilage that we're interested in uh, that exist within the body. And so hyaline cartilage, elastic, and fibrocartilage. Hyaline cartilage is the most abundant type of cartilage in the body, and it provides support, flexibility, and resilience. So if you feel your trachea, or if you feel your ribs as they connect to the sternum, that's all hyaline cartilage. If you um, think about more elastic but supportive types of cartilage, you would, you would think of uh, elastic cartilage. And fibrocartilage having more collagen, more uh, tensile strength is, is another type of cartilage that we look at. We have a nice image from the book that sort of shows a, a little bit of a roadmap as to where these cartilage types are. So you can see the blue is the hyaline cartilage. It's the ends of our joints, the connections of the ribs, uh, cartilage in our nose. And then if we look at the red, the fibrocartilage, we see that that's these intervertebral discs as well as the pubic symphysis. So the, the pubic symphysis is this connection point in between each of the pubic bones. And uh, one of the interesting things about it is that if you get interested in forensic anthropology as you go on, and you might wonder how, how did they know when they found a skeleton that it was a female skeleton and that she had likely had children. A couple of things there in terms of determining sex within a, a skeleton if, if it's found is this pubic arch, the arch that exists between both of the pubic bones will be more uh, of a, an open shape, more of a, a U that is expanded, an upside down U that's been expanded. And then um, the ilia, each of the, the ilia that we have here is more expanded as well. So all of this assists within birth and the, the determiner when you found a skeleton to know that this woman may have had a child is that during the embryonic growth of, of the child, the uh, pubic symphysis is relaxed and, and begins to move apart. And it never quite fully heals after uh, a childbirth where, where the entire birth canal has had to be expanded. So the combination of oxytocin and another hormone called relaxin uh, opens up this pubic symphysis. So uh, in shifting gears back to our cartilage types, elastic cartilage, you can feel a little bit of that within your ear. So hyaline in the blue, 
uh, fibrocartilage in the red and elastic in the green. And you can kind of see based on these color locations that the abundance of hyaline is the most, fibrocartilage is the next, and then elastic would be the last. The other thing that you can notice in this image is the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. And we hit on that a little bit when we were talking about the terms of proximal and distal within lecture two. So the axial skeleton, the skull, the vertebra, down to the sacrum, the, the ribs, and the sternum. The most common mistake, mistake that I see for students within this content is to um, assume that the, both of the ilia are a part of the axial skeleton and they are not. So uh, they're, they're part of the appendicular skeleton. So each of these coxa, which a coxa is a ilium, an ischium, which if you're sitting down, you're sitting on your ischial tuberosity, and then the pubis. Those three bones, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis form the coxa, C-O-X-A. So each coxa is the equivalent of a scapula in the shoulder. And within this then, one of the confusion points is to try to not confuse coxa with coccyx. Coccyx is the end of the sacrum. So the growth of cartilage, uh, we have two different ways that cartilage grows. It can uh, grow in an appositional way or interstitial. So appositional is gonna give us more of a, a girth or a, a widening of, of cartilage and interstitial is gonna be more of a, um, a growth of the cartilage within that usually we see within a lengthening of bone. And so this idea that cartilage is transferring to bone, the term for that is calcification and ossification. So ossification is the process of cartilage calcifying and changing over into bone. And again, the axial and appendicular skeleton, just being comfortable with those, those uh, locations and items. And then as, as always, we have to classify everything because we're humans and we like to classify everything. So we classify bones by shape. We have long bones that are longer than they are wide and short bones that are just that. They're more um, cuboid usually and smaller. So if I was to ask you a question about the phalanges, would you say that the phalanges are short bones or long bones? And after a second to think about that, what we realize is that the phalanges, even though they're small, they're actually longer than they are wide. And so they're long bones. That's um, a common question that will come up to try to stump you. Sesamoid bones are a type of short bone that these bones develop within tendons. And so the patella is an example of that. And we also have small sesamoid bones that have uh, developed within each of our uh, fingers within our digits. So we see those two. Flat bones like the ribs, the skull, uh, the ilium, those are items like that. Irregular bones, complicated shapes like the uh, vertebra, for instance. And so you have a nice example of those types of bones uh, where they're located. The functions of bones then, these first three, we usually really associate with what we've known ever since we were kids and like with Halloween. So uh, support, protection, and movement. So the skeleton that is moving around or uh, the, the skeleton that's protecting organs or supporting you know, everything. So everything is pretty much hung off of the skeleton. And that makes sense. These are pretty acceptable functions of bones for us. The, the couple that come in that are new for most people, unless you've had anatomy and physiology before, is the fact that bones uh, have storage within them. So they're storing items like calcium and phosphorus. They also within their core are forming blood cells. Another term for blood cell formation is hematopoiesis. And um, as we age, some of these uh, areas of blood cell formation that we would call red marrow transition to what we would refer to as yellow marrow as they transition from bone forming cells to fat storage. Even though we do still form blood cells as we get older, usually after the age of 30, somewhere in there, 
our red bone marrow has transitioned to yellow bone marrow in a lot of the diaphysis or the, the shaft portion of our long bones. And so we still form blood cells in the epiphyses or the ends of the bones and a lot of our flat bones. Some bone markings that we'll see that you'll get really even more familiar with within the lab content. All these bulges, depressions, and holes. So really thinking about uh, how do muscles through their tendons and then how do ligaments connect up to these, these bone surfaces? What joints are within these? What vessels are passing through them? And so um, we're really interested to learn about all of these markings of bone to understand what the purpose of them is. And uh, one distinction to make here, tendons will attach from muscle to bone, whereas ligaments will attach from bone to bone. So tendons attach from muscle to bone and ligaments attach from bone to bone. Some of these projections that we'll see, uh, tuberosity, for instance, we have a tibial tuberosity. If you feel below your patella or your kneecap and you feel that projection on the tibia, it's a tibial tuberosity. It's kind of a rounded projection that lets the, the patellar uh, ligament connect into it. The, we have crests, so the top, when you put your hands on your hips, you're on the iliac crest. A trochanter, if you put your hands to the widest portion of your hips, you're most likely pushing on your greater trochanter on the femur. Uh, a line, we have these lines for attachment, so if you feel on your deltoid, and, and it connects into the deltoid tuberosity. That tuberosity also is in a bit of a shape of a line. And we'll see other lines that are like this that uh, are for, for muscle attachment. Tubercles, we see tubercles like on our humerus, we have a uh, lesser and a greater tubercle. And so these are these small rounded projections that uh, assist with muscle attachment and also can create pathways for the passage of tendons, for instance. Epicondyle, so epi is above. Condyle is an articular surface. And so this is the area like on the outside of your femur, for instance, on the, the distal end of it, where you could feel those outside surfaces would be a medial and a lateral epicondyle. We have spines on the spine of our vertebra, for instance. And processes are these projections of bone that usually articulate with other bones. So we have uh, a process, for instance, on the, the, this bridge that goes in between our temporal bone and our zygomatic. And we have the zygomatic process of temporal. So, so this is a projection of the temporal bone that interacts with the zygomatic bone, for instance. So just a few examples of each of those. You have some really great images in your book uh, to work on these. And we'll be doing some good exercises in lab that help reinforce all of this as well. Projections, we'll see heads, like we have a femoral head, uh, facets. Just like facets that you'd see on a gemstone, these are flattened surfaces where bones slide over each other. Condyles, these rounded articular projections, like at the end of our femur to interact with the tibia. A ramus is an arm-like bar, like on our mandible, we have this connection point that, that connects it in the, the mandible in the jaw. Again, really good images and reinforcement of these if you're interested in building cards or doing something to help you reinforce that, or uh, for instance, using the, uh, the Pearson content for self-testing. More bone markings, depressions and openings. A meatus is a canal-like passageway. It's not a canal because the canal goes all the way through. But if you put your finger in your ear, you're putting your finger into your external acoustic meatus. And so uh, we also have an internal acoustic meatus that we'll take a look at as well. A sinus is a cavity within a bone. So we have like frontal sinus and deep inside we have a sphenoid sinus, our maxillary sinuses. So these are the, those openings that we referenced that help lighten the skull and help with timber, the T-I-M-B-R-E. Fossa is Latin for a bowl. So these are, 
these are bone shapes that will receive a usually like a, an end of a condyle or of another articular surface. Or they can also be areas that are scooped out that make a nice connection point for muscle. We have grooves and fissures that are just what their, their words, the, the names of these say, the definition. A groove is a furrow, a fissure is a narrow slit-like opening. A foramen is, we'll see a lot of these foramina. Foramina is plural and foramen is singular. And these are round or oval openings through a bone. So usually through foramen or foramina, we'll see the passage of artery, nerve, and vein. And they usually travel together. So a few of those key areas. Some bone texture items. The fact that bone has two different types of textures, depending on where we're looking at on the bone, compact bone and spongy bone. And so um, the structure of a long bone, we have a diaphysis or a shaft. This has a marrow cavity within it and an epiphysis, which is the end of each of these items. So another great image, proximal epiphysis. This is the epiphysis that's closer to the axial skeleton origin a distal epiphysis, which is uh, further away from that point of origin, and a diaphysis or a shaft. In that diaphysis is a medullary cavity where we see compact bone is surrounding this and inside is spongy bone and it even looks kind of like a sponge. So that, here's a zoom into that. The compact bone is forming like an outer collar around these bones and then the spongy bone is more open on the interior. You'll also see a lot of these arch-like shapes within the spongy bone. And spongy bone can also, these shapes can be referred to as trabiculae. So trabiculae and spongy bone are synonymous. And you'll see the passage of vasculature, nerves, uh, all of these components that, that move through this. So then uh, another thing that we see within this is each of these like rings of a tree. And so we'll look at each of those structures and then articular cartilage that can be on the outside of that. So the membranes of bone, periosteum, so we're around the bone, periosteum, is this outer fibrous layer. It has an inner osteogenic layer. So this is where, you know, we're talking about something that is like as thin as a sheet of paper, even thinner maybe. And it has on the on one side of the paper, it's fibrous. On the other side of the paper, it has these cells that we would refer to as osteogenic. So osteo is bone. Genic is like genesis or creation. So within this layer, we have osteoblasts. And I think of the, the B in blast as building. Osteoblasts build bone. Osteoclasts destroy bone or break it down. And osteogenic cells are what we would refer to also as stem cells, for instance. So we have osteogenic cells making these cells. And then the blasts are building bone. They're storing calcium when we need them to. And osteoclasts are releasing, releasing calcium when we need them to. So we're going to see that we need a lot of calcium for every thought, every muscle movement, almost everything that we do, we need a lot of calcium. And so we've got to take it in, in, in our diet and we can't have too much of it in the bloodstream or we will ossify like valves in our heart or uh, form kidney stones. So we need to bind it back into the bone of the skeleton to then release it later when we're low on it within our diet. So these cells really play into our physiology of bone. We also see that there's a really good nutrient feed. When we see neurovascular, we realize that the neuro is the nerve fiber and the vascular is the artery and vein that feed into this, as well as lymphatic vessels that will enter through these nutrient foramina. So if you feel on your chin, you may be able to feel a small indention on both sides of your chin. There's a nutrient foramina that's called the mental foramen. So this region in here, if you were thinking and you held your, your chin like this, this is the mental region. So you can feel a mental foramina where there's nutrient feed in and out of our mandibles. And so uh, all of this periosteum is secured or held to the bone 
with what's referred to as Sharpies fibers or perforating fibers. And these are so tightly held onto the bone that if you peel away periosteum from the bone in dissection, it <clears throat> sounds like a really aggressive type of uh, duct tape. So really very connected fibers. And so effectively our tendons transition into and become periosteum. And that's how we attach muscle to bone. Endosteum, we're gonna go inside the medullary cavity of the bone. And we're gonna see that we have uh, another layer of, of this that is effectively going to uh, have osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So we're working on building bone on the outside of the bone and on the inside of the bone. We're building it and breaking it down. So here the endosteum inside that medullary cavity, the periosteum out around it, the, the connecting perforating or Sharpies fibers. And so um, all of these different connections come together. We see that compact bone collar with a uh, trabeculae or spongy bone interior. So some of these uh, short, irregular and flat bones then, this is the model for long bones. In these other types of bones, we'll still see periosteum, endosteum and spongy bone. Spongy bone has an additional name called diplo. So diplo is not only a uh, DJ, this is also a name for the spongy bone that's specific to flat bones. And then there's bone marrow that's fit in all throughout between the trabeculae. A little zoom in here of the skull. We see this compact bone layer on the outside of this and then the spongy bone layer, the diplo within. And then we zoom into that diplo and we see all of these trabeculae that, that give it its name of spongy bone. So where is blood forming tissue in adults or hematopoietic tissue? And in adults, it's in the heads of the femur and humerus and in the diplo of the flat bones. In newborn infants, it's everywhere. It's within the medullary cavities and all spaces in spongy bone. What would the difference be between an adult and an infant in terms of needing to formulate blood cells? It's obviously growth. And so we need to grow quite a lot from an infant to an adult, but once we're an adult, our growth phase has ended uh, around you know somewhere late 20s, early 30s, and um, we don't need as much blood creation uh, cells within our body. We do need to store fat for survival, and so we have a transition there. The microscopic anatomy of bone, kind of coming back to some of those cells, again, osteogenic or osteoprogenitor cells. And so these are stem cells in the periosteum and endosteum that give rise to osteoblasts. So osteoblasts are the bone, bone forming cells. The B is the building. And then uh, osteocytes are mature bone cells. So once these cells have aged to a point, they just sort of become part of the, uh, the makeup of the bone. And then these osteoclasts are the cells that break down bone or this process of resorption is what that's referred to. So four types of cells, osteogenic, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. Those are the four cell types of skeletal tissue. Within compact bone, then, we look at this Haversian system or an osteon. It's the structural unit that uh, has lamella, which are the rings of the tree, and then a hole down the center that's called the central or the Haversian canal. And so all of this is about transferring vessels and nerves all throughout the bone. So here's one of those osteons. And we see that these lamella are layered on each other. And when they're layered, their collagen fibers oppose each other. So they resist torsional or twisting force of the bone. Helps make the bone very strong. So pound for pound, bone is, is stronger and lighter than steel. The um, continuing within this perforating or Volkmann's canals are really just communicating canals between the central canals of, of each of these osteons or Haversian canal systems. If you hear Haversian canal system and osteon, that's the same thing. 
lacuna, lacuna matata, just kidding, lacuna are small cavities that contain osteocytes. So lacuna are these little dark spots that we're going to see within the microscope that contain osteocytes. And then canaliculi, a little canal, are hair-like canals that connect the lacuna to each other and then to the central canal. So we're just talking about a system that allows for the transfer of neurovascular feed all throughout the bone and gives us a lot of strength in that outer compact bone collar. Really cool image of this. Uh, we pop out one of these osteons and we see each of the lamella that's within there in the central canal. And then you see a lot of those. And then you realize that down that central canal is a neurovascular bundle and it crosses over to meet up with another central canal. And then it drops in and crosses over and goes into the spongy bone. And these crossing points are those perforating or Volkmann's canals. In the microscope, we'd see the central canal. Each of these rings is a lamella. Each of these dark spots is a lacuna. Inside the lacuna would be an osteocyte or a mature cell. And um, we just have that repeating and it gives the, the bone a tremendous amount of strength. The spongy bone then has those trabeculae. It does not, in, when we're in the spongy bone, we don't see the order of those osteons. We don't see the Haversian canal. Um, and we see irregular lamella osteocytes and canaliculi. It's not as ordered. And um, the capillaries in the end osteum supply nutrients to this, to the trabeculae. So, um, we will see some lamella, but they're a lot more haphazard. And um, within this, you know, central canal and, and the lacuna that are within this, the order is just not the same as what we see within the compact bone, but uh, they do have some of those structures. So if we think about what is in bone from a chemical perspective, we have organic components and inorganic. The organic components would be those cells, the four cell types that we looked at, as well as osteoid, which is organic bone matrix secreted by osteoblasts. So osteon is a Haversian canal system. Osteoid is organic bone matrix. And this bone matrix, which is um, what osteoblasts are secreting to build more bone, has proteoglycans, glycoproteins, and collagen fibers. So we're getting this uh, incredible blend of organic items to build the bone. In the inorganic realm, 65% of our bone mass is made up of mineral salts. So most of what a bone is, is mineral salts. And these mineral salts are calcium and phosphate for the most part. Um, as a group, this is called hydroxyapatates or apatites. So hydro hydroxyapatites are mineral salts. Within this then, um, that concludes our discussion of, of the, this first portion of, of some of the, uh, the skeletal tissue and it sets us up for lecture number four. So um, thanks for joining in on this and uh, I hope that this has been helpful for you. And as we uh, move forward, remember to reference this content because you will see qu really good questions around uh, the bone types within skeletal tissue as well as uh, composition and function, all of those different items. So thanks for checking this video out and I look forward to visiting with you in our next discussion.